Welcome back, everyone. We are ready to get going with our next speaker. Um, our next speaker is Andrew Rin from Meritas, one of NAFA's great partners. And Andrew has spoken at countless, at this point, I think, uh, different series that we've done in collaboration with FSP over the last really two years. Can you believe that, Andrew? I think it's been two years since we started on the advanced practice uh, symposium track. Never fails to amaze us. He's an awesome speaker. We're delighted that you're here, Andrew. And please tell us all about non-qualified executive benefits. The floor is yours. Suzanne, thank you very much. I caught the tail end of your presentation. Awesome job. So I wish I could have seen the whole thing. But welcome, everyone. I appreciate the time here today. Again, uh, Andrew Rin with Emeritus. And I'm here today to talk about non-qualified executive benefits. So um, I do want to thank NAFA for putting on this symposium. Uh, the whole idea of this kind of business performance impact week is a, it's a huge deal. It is a great collaboration between, you know, what NAFA does and what FSP does best. So hopefully the next hour is engaging, it's conversational, and it's in enlightening. So I think they've given me 40, 45 minutes of content. And then we get to actually engage one another afterwards to see if there's any questions or further discussion to go ahead and have. So... Without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started on this. So the first key is making sure the presentation will advance. Let's see if we can go ahead and make it do that. Then we'll be in great shape today. Perfect. Okay. All right. So, so we're going to be talking about, as I just mentioned, about non-qualified executive benefits. I am excited to be speaking to you about that. And some of you that have been in this marketplace a while might be wondering, you know, why now? Why not? Why now, Andrew? Why are we discussing this? And at least in my humble opinion, this is a probably an ideal time. You know, all the plants are aligned for 2020, 2021 being the, the ideal year to talk about executive benefits. Um, so for those newbies, and there's some in every group, um, and we'll go into a little more detail in just a moment. We are talking about non-qualified benefits here today. So what we will not be discussing is uh, traditional qualified benefits like 401ks or um, profit sharing plans or defined benefit plans, whether they be traditional DB plans or uh, cash balance plans. No, we'll be, we're going to be talking about uh, non-qualified plans, plans you put together for what we call um, top hat employees. So we'll discuss that more in detail in just a moment before we launch into some strategies and some ideas. But first, I think it's important for all of us to know as we engage clients this year, why now? Why non-qualified benefits? And I really think there's four primary reasons. Uh, the first reason being uh, the, con the economy continues to go ahead and, and roar right along. It's tough to go ahead and have a lot of those key employees attached to your business, to your corporation. Um, a lot of them are being wooed away. So what do I have if I'm a business owner that has some teeth into it? Uh, some golden handcuffs, a platinum handcuff, if you will, to keep those key employees around. That's what we're trying to do right now. And this economy, because it's tough, is, is calling for us as advisors to have solutions. We'll talk about some of those solutions today. Secondly, second reason, traditional possible. Oh, I was told that I was muted and now I'm unmuted. So Apologize for that. Uh, I'm not sure how that happened. So for those of you that didn't hear the beginning of this, uh, Andrew Wren with Emeritus. And what I was talking about is how as excited as I was to talk about uh, executive benefits today, namely non-qualified executive benefits. So we're gonna talk about four primary reasons why this is the time to talk about non-qualified benefits. And so we'll go ahead and delve right into that. And now that I know that you can hear me, this is gonna be so much more beneficial for, for I think both parties involved. So with that being said, what are the four reasons why we wanna go ahead and get into this period, of, get into this right now? So the economy, huge deal right now, 
The economy is souped up, it's roaring along. This is the time if you're an advisor with a business owner client to be talking about NQ benefits, non-qualified benefits. What do I have by way of a golden or a platinum handcuff, if you will, to keep those, those employees around? That's huge, that's reason number one. Reason number two, traditional qualified plans are not very flexible um, by any way, shape or form. You're stuck. If you're a highly paid executive, a business owner even, um, you're stuck kind of with the rules and regulations of a traditional qualified arrangement. So you could only put so much into a qualified plan. And if you're a, you know, a fluent business owner executive, you want to do just a little bit more. And also at the same time with qualified plans, yes, you're stuck with some of the participation, vesting, fiduciary requirements that everybody else is stuck with. And so the whole idea of non-qualified benefits, our discussion topic for today is to give you the advisor a, another narrative, another story, if you will, to talk to the clients. So third reason why we're talking about non-qualified benefits now, in case you haven't been reading the news, we're probably gonna be going into a higher income tax environment very, very shortly now. And so being able to be uh, provide a benefit for that highly paid um, executive, I think is huge. And I think going forward, the more we could speak to the current tax environment is gonna be a big deal. So we gotta be able to provide things for those business owners themselves, but also those affluent executives. Lastly, the fourth reason to talk about non-qualified now, it's what I call if the business wins, the executive wins. So you got a healthy business at the end of the day, you're gonna be able to sell it for more. And that's gonna tie directly into your feeling of affluence at retirement. The more you get for your business, the better off you're gonna be at the end of the day. And having a healthy key employee executive benefit sort of an arrangement adds value to your business. Second reason for you know the, the business wins you win is it's about time if you're a business owner to start utilizing your business, have the business work for you rather than you constantly working for the business. So if I can make the business work for me, that's really the idea. And that's how we're getting into to the discussion here today. So this is gonna be our official agenda here. We're gonna be doing a tour of executive benefit options and we're gonna be hitting three primary topics. And for my friends at NAFA who might be monitoring this, I'm getting a window asking me to admit new guests. I'm assuming you have the power to do that yourself and you don't want me to keep admitting new guests. I've been doing it so far, but I pair a better stop on that and focus on my presentation. So thank you for that. I just wanna let you guys know that. Okay, so we're gonna be talking about three primary non-qualified benefits, executive bonus, split dollar, and deferred compensation plans. And as I kind of set the tone for that, you know, these are all arrangements that are governed at some level by ERISA, right? So the Employee Retirement Income Security Act. And the idea here is with traditional qualified plans, they're fully covered by the whole gambit of restrictions of a typical arrangement. We're trying to go ahead and carve out an exception for that. So if you have an exception to that, typically what you're providing a benefit for is what we call your, your top hat employees. Those could be your highly compensated employees and or ones that we call uh, ones that are in a select group of management. So these are kind of their, our carved out employees. And typically I uh, talk to my team and say, you know what, let's get a census and see what these employees are all about to see if we could offer these non-qualified benefits for these top hat employees. If you try to cover too many employees, um, you're gonna be bound by the typical rules and restrictions of a traditional fully covered qualified plan and all the ERISA rules that come along with it. We wanna avoid that if at all possible. So that's, that's, the, that's what the goal here is today. So regardless of any of these, these things that you see here in front of you, whether it's split dollar, executive bonus, deferred comp, they're gonna be classified as either a, a pension plan or a welfare benefit plan. But I don't say that to scare you. I say that in such a way where the rules and restrictions, depending on which one of those they are, are gonna vary slightly. But as long as we're still segmenting these arrangements for that top hat, 
those uh, select group of management, those highly compensated employees, we're still in a position, even with um, all these plans you see here in front of me, to be exempt from most of the onerous restrictions of, of, of typical qualified plans. All right. So these are our three arrangements, executive bonus, split dollar, and deferred comp. And so real quickly, and we'll go into the details in just a moment, that's why we're listening here today, but executive bonus, the key is with that is you have a, a highly paid employee, a key person per se, and you want them to own the underlying executive benefit. Most of these are funded with life insurance. So you're gonna be an employer that's gonna be bonusing compensation for a key employee to subsidize, in many cases, fully pay for a fully owned life insurance benefit. More details shortly, we'll be hitting it very quickly. Okay, uh, the next topic to talk about is we're gonna be hitting one of my personal favorites, um, split dollar. Uh, the rules and restrictions for those of us that have been in the, in the business a while are significantly um, easier to understand and to follow than they were a little more than 20 years ago. When I first got in the business, I met a gentleman that worked at one of my first companies that told me there was about 140 different iterations of split dollar. Arguably, we're down to two, maybe three these days. So we're gonna talk about just about a couple of those iterations today. I hope to be able to convince you that this could be a great um, bonus, or excuse me, executive arrangement if bonus doesn't work. Okay, then we'll talk about deferred compensation. Love speaking about deferred compensation. And this is an arrangement where you're looking at something where you have a, employer that wants a little bit stronger handcuffs. So let's say instead of golden handcuffs, it's platinum handcuffs. So we'll talk about kind of the demographic for that, the arrangements that are out there, and maybe some of the tax and planning considerations you need to think about. And then at the very end, because I always like to have this special bonus, we have a special bonus um, executive benefit just to keep you listening, which I'm guessing most of you may not have heard of which combines some of the best attributes of some of these other techniques, which we're gonna be spending some time on today. So more later on that. All right, so let's start. Does this scenario sound familiar to you? I'm an employer and I need an executive benefit that's simple to understand. Andrew, I don't want something that's gonna confuse my client. I want it to be reasonable in cost. I don't wanna to have to be awake at night staring at the bedroom ceiling thinking about whether I'm I'm missing this um, whether it's you know too costly or whether there's, there's some admin I want to be able to if I'm an employer control the level the benefit and I want to be able to go ahead and target those key employees all right if you have a an arrangement like that we're generally looking at executive bonus this is going to be easy for most of you listening here today but in spite of me having done this for going on two decades now, I never get tired of talking about executive bonus. Why? Because it's straightforward, easy to explain. Almost all advisors get it. More importantly, we have a, a duty, if you will, in my humble opinion, if we could make it easy to make it easy for our business owner clients. So if we could make it easy, make it easy. An executive bonus is definitely easy and checks a lot of those boxes, uh, if you will. Oh yeah, tax deductible. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, subject to reasonable compensation guidelines, of course, but let's, let's hit that. So high level, this is how it works. And for those of you that are total newbies, follow this closely. For those of you that have been around a while, I'm hoping this sounds really familiar to you. So we have an employer that wants to provide a golden handcuff, if you will, but not a platinum handcuff. They're gonna be bonusing compensation. That's gonna be taxable income. It's gonna be deductible. So you get a tax deduction for that. You see the IRS up there in the upper left. As long as the compensation is what we call reasonable under 162 of the revenue code, it is deemed to be fully tax deductible. Those premiums are gonna be paid based upon the bonus. The bonus is gonna go ahead and support a personally owned life insurance policy. Who owns it? 
the executive owns it. The executive can name his or her own beneficiary, if you will. Um, you don't technically have to have a life insurance policy, but nine tenths of the time you're going to be looking at a life insurance policy for, for a typical executive bonus arrangement. And what I like about these arrangements is although they don't give the employer total control over the, the executive arrangement, it gives that employee a sense of well-being, a sense of being in a, in a select group, and it does give them a, an executive arrangement that's different than what everybody else has. Of the benefits for the employer, these are things that we need, need to verbalize to our, to our clients, to our business owner clients, if you will. And it's a great recruiting tool. Um, I see these things all over the time. Here's somebody I'm still admitting. I'll just go ahead and do it. Uh, focus on select executives. So again, you could uh, discriminate on a permissible basis um, as long as they're in this, uh, they're, they're in the proper part of the census here, that select group of management. It's simple. I mean, arguably with executive bonus, and I don't want to go too far in saying this because I'm not trying to practice law here, that oftentimes you can get away with, you know, either not having your writing or just having a very minimal agreement. You know, arguably these things, um, depending on what school of thought you come from, are not even deemed to be pension plans, much less welfare benefit plans. Tax deductible, subject to reasonable compensation guidelines, of course. So make sure we hit that. Benefits for the employee, you're rewarding who you care about the most. Um, power the controls with the executive, not accessible to creditors. So um, the states all have their own creditor protection statutes. That's gonna vary. So I'm not speaking about those, but there's some level of creditor protection for life insurance in every single state. Provides a potential source of tax-free income, either personally on life insurance policies on the part of the executive. They could take withdrawals up to basis loans after that. These are things above and beyond what you do for this executive from a qualified plan perspective. So this is like this is more or less a, a business sponsored supplemental income plan. All right, that's more or less what executive bonus arrangements are. And that's that's key here. Oh, and by the way, if and almost every illustration system from every carrier allows for this, you could illustrate a double bonus design. So although the bonus themselves are taxable to the employee, if you want to mitigate that tax, it's not, it's not possible to completely eliminate it for obvious reasons, but if you want to mitigate it, you can certainly double bonus the employee, the compensation, which is also deductible if it's, if it's reasonable. So points to ponder, um, is this effective for owner employees? Well, it depends. And I know that's an attorney-ish sort of an answer. For C corporations, arguably yes, but if you don't have a true separate uh, tax entity or separation rather between the employer and the employee, it tends not to give you a whole lot of leverage. So typically you're, in, you're gonna wanna do this for the key employees. Uh, it will work for owners, but you have to you have to have a C corporation and not a pass through like a, like a partnership or an LLC. Uh, we talked about the writing requirement. Um, tax considerations we've discussed. Designs could be relatively straightforward and simple. Uh, restrictions, um, yes, the only pushback, my team, myself, those that do what I do, arguably you that, that on these arrangements that you'll ever get is if the employee owns the benefit, can't they just walk away with from, uh, from the arrangement, Andrew? Can't they walk away at the end of the day? Arguably they can, they, they own the life insurance. But what you can do is put a a reba on it. That's the restrictive executive bonus arrangement, a restrictive executive bonus arrangement, a reba. And what that will do is allow you as the employer to have at least a semblance of control. What a reba will do is prevent the employee, the executive, if you will, from being able to access the cash values to uh, assign the life insurance policy to an outside entity like, like a bank. So that's a fair amount of control. It, no, it's not the same as ownership, but even with executive bonus arrangements, there are certain restrictions. And if I was doing a CLE, we talk about whether a REBA um, 
allows or pushes an executive bonus arrangement over the edge and makes a pension plan, which will increase some of the requirements from an ERISA perspective. But the good news is we're not doing a CLE webinar and you could discuss that with your advanced market professional. All right, so that's executive bonus. Let's talk about our next one. So I'm an employer and I need an executive benefit that allows an executive to share a small portion of the benefit cost allows me to target only my key employees, allows me as the employer to recoup my cost and permits me to control the level of the benefit. So picture a pyramid, if you will, with maybe executive bonus kind of being on the base of that pyramid. There's lots of applications for executive bonus. You're working up the pyramid now. The employer is a little bit more selective. They really wanna control the benefit. They wanna get, they wanna recoup their cost. Again, they wanna you know, focus just on those key employees. That's a common denominator between the two. So what works for that? Often in those situations as we're having the talk on the phone or doing chat or email, we'll come to whether or not split dollar is gonna be most appropriate here. And again, split dollar, fun stuff. Um, I know this is a financial webinar, but I think you should get excited about split dollar. I really do because that allows an employer employee to split the cost and benefits of a life insurance policy. Don't let people like me and, and that do what I do or write articles, and I do plenty of them, scare you away from split dollar because all you're essentially doing is allowing somebody to take um, a life insurance policy essentially subsidize it. Another way of saying is it allows somebody with the deep pockets, namely the employer, to subsidize a nice life insurance arrangement for somebody with shallower pockets, typically the, the key employee, but they're not too much shallower because they are a key employee. This is a golden handcuff, just like the executive bonus arrangement. Relatively inexpensive to administer. These will deem to be, these are deemed to be um, uh, pension plans, these are, or excuse me, welfare benefit plans. Um, so there is a slightly higher level of, of uh, uh, requirements, nothing close to a traditional qualified plan. So don't worry about that. Um, allows for recoupment of costs. Let me explain. Okay, two basic types. If you could master this slide, I think this is the hardest slide in the whole presentation. And you're gonna be golden after this because you're totally gonna be on top of this. Two basic types, there's what we call the endorsement, some people call it the economic benefit method, and the, the other type of split dollar is the collateral assignment method. Some people call that loan regime split dollar. So the endorsement method really is all about control. That's that employer that wants to be what I call the nominal owner of the life insurance contract. So again, you're splitting ownership essentially between owner and employee, but the nominal owner, the legal owner is gonna be the employer. So they wanna be able to control it. And we'll make this easy. You're essentially sharing the death benefit. So the portion of the death benefit that's assigned over to the executive and his or her family, that portion of that death benefit, they gotta pay what I call rent on it. So if you have a million dollar policy and I'm just making it easy and you're splitting it up 500,000, each way, the employee has to pay rent on the economic benefit portion, and that's the 500,000. So what's that rent? What am I talking about? That's a certain rate per, per thousand. So the employer is writing the premium check, all right? It's endorsement split dollar. The cost of that for the employee is the pure amount of life insurance, and that's the 500,000 in my example that's assigned over to them. Um, most practitioners use something called the table 2001, which is a certain rate per thousand. I don't have all my notes in front of me, but if I remember correctly, if you're looking at something like a 45 year old, that's like $1.53 per thousand of economic benefit rent you have to pay. So for, you know, let's say it's a million dollar policy and um, that's all assigned over um, to the employee that's gonna be $1,530 of income that's gonna be assessed to the employee every year. That's the rent. And if they're in a 
you know, a reasonable tax bracket, you know, 30%. I don't think you're looking at much over four or $500 worth of that actual out-of-pocket money that the employee would pay. Bottom line, this is cheap rent. It's cheap rent for endorsement arrangement. The younger you are, the cheaper the rent is. Different business, excuse me, insurance carriers have their own alternative renewable term rates, which under the final split dollar regs, you could also use. And often those tables could be 50 to 60% less uh, rent, if you will. So love endorsement arrangements. There's a lot you could do with them. Um, you can have an exit at death. One technical point I better go ahead and make here. Um, the portion that's what's owed back to the employer, because remember the employer wants to recoup their cost. That's going to be the higher of the cash values or the premiums paid. So it's going to be the higher of the two. And the rest is going to be signed over to the employee's family. So there's a death. Kind of how exit works is the employer will get the higher of those values, cash value or premiums paid. The rest goes to, to the employee's family. Um, you could do exit during life. Split dollar arrangements are amazingly easy to go ahead and terminate as long as the employer is made whole. Typically, you can go ahead and do that just out of the cash values. I'm going to talk about arrangement shortly before we end here today. This is the bonus arrangement, which is kind of a, um, a little bit of an advanced take on endorsement split dollar. And I'll, I'll hit on that exit part in a little more detail later. Okay, the other part of split dollar, it's, it's the collateral assignment method. That's where the employee is going to be the nominal or legal owner, if you will. So they'll be the owner of the contract. The employer's still writing the premium check. Those premium checks, if it's a loan arrangement, <laughs> big surprise, they're deemed to be legal loans for tax purposes. So every check that the employer is writing, because remember they're fully subsidizing this arrangement, is deemed to be a loan to the employee. And what happens when you have somebody that extends a loan to you you have to pay interest. Think about your mortgage, your home mortgage. And just like with, even though it's going up a little bit lately, um, home mortgages, interest rates are freakishly low right now. Very, very low. Uh, Long-term AFR, I think for March, is something like 1.86%. So just like with endorsement arrangements, where the cost of rent was low, the cost of interest is very low here. And how you handle that interest, whether you impute it, you actually pay it, or in some cases accrue it, there's different ways to go ahead and handle it, but it has to, it has to be accounted for regardless. All right. Now there's a other techniques that you could utilize these arrangements for, but I'm not going to get into those right now because I really want to just kind of hit those, those, those two types. Exit at death is obvious except I want to be clear on this part that if you do die and you're subject to a loan regime split dollar, your executive, even though you own the contract, the employer has to be made whole. All those premiums that you've been paying interest on or, in, or income has been imputed to you, all those premiums are going to be paid back out of the life insurance policy. But you're going to personally own a life insurance contract and Loan split dollar, collateral assignment split dollar, in my humble opinion, personal opinion, as we go into this potentially higher income tax environment, God, if you're not talking about this, um, please be talking about loan split dollar. It's a huge, huge deal. Because think about it this way. Think about um, individuals, these key employees that we're talking about, they're going to very soon be in an even higher income tax paradigm. So, you know, going from a top marginal rate, going from 35% to, you know, 39 or 40%, depending on which Biden proposal you look at. Think about the Medicare surtax. Think about state income taxes. There's some states out there where, you know, you could very well be over 50 to, you know, 50, 55% by way of just income taxes. And I know we have 80 some people listening today and you know what state that is or states those are. There's two or three of them that are that way. So if you can create a like a dichotomy, if you will, between a business, which in many cases is going to be in a lower tax bracket, even under the Biden proposal, even if they you know have C corps exposed to a 28 percent 
you know, rather than a 21%, there's still going to be a huge uh, gap between individual uh, rates and business rates, if you will. That is, that's tax leverage, ladies and gentlemen. So that's, that's why loan split dollar is such a, a big deal right now. We have fun all day long illustrating that. Benefits to the employer. We got to give ourselves enough time here. We can't get too excited about split dollar, but benefits for the employer. It's a great retention tool, helps to recruit the select executives. It's manageable by way of cost and allows for that tax arbitrage that I just passionately told you about just now. Benefits for the employees. You could target and benefit those key select employees all day long. Uh, executive employer's own policies offer control. So whole idea is if you own it rather than the employer own it, it does give you a, a degree of flexibility versus other traditional arrangements. And again, personally owned, in this case, life insurance contract, uh, withdrawals, you know, up to basis, loans after that, all the advantages of a personally owned life insurance contract still with you. All right. Ah, okay, let's just go ahead and since I told you the answer already, got a little flap happy with a, with a PowerPoint. Does this scenario sound familiar? Allows an executive to defer a portion of taxable income, allows me as the business owner to target only my key employees. I can recoup my cost, control the benefit. So if you're looking for that true platinum handcuff, um, above and beyond executive bonus, above and beyond split dollar. You're working up the pyramid. I think you're getting near the top if you're looking at our friend deferred compensation, non-qualified deferred compensation. So this is flexible. And at the risk of getting into the weeds here, um, it's also an unsecured and unfunded promise to pay a future benefit to a select group of of employees. So we're still looking at those top hat employees that hasn't changed. That's a common element through all these executive arrangements. But this is something that's going to be an employer owned arrangement, often funded with life insurance, but it could be funded by other investments as well, you know, mutual funds, for, for example, um, in some cases, annuities, if you do it right. But the key is, if it's traditional deferred compensation, if it's a promise of future compensation to an individual, that's going to come under our good friend 409A of the Internal Revenue Code. And that covers all the rules and restrictions of deferred comp. Not that long ago, even after I got into the business, um, deferred comp wasn't codified. There was no real provision in the Internal Revenue Code that truly covered it. Um, those glory days are now gone. So if you want the true control of a deferred compensation, you are relegated to making sure you abide by 409A along with the distribution requirements, uh, the provisions against taking haircuts, and some of the possible prepayment penalties if you don't do it right. Don't mean to scare you because deferred comp can be awesome, especially if you have a very effective uh, TPA to administer it for you, which is hugely important. It's exempt, just like those other arrangements, bonus arrangements, split dollar, from most ERISA requirements. And what I like about it, what I mean about the control, about having kind of uh, real power over the executive benefit is you could attach um, vesting requirements to this. So if, you know, my, Suzanne's my top key employee, I like her to, I'd like her to meet certain profitability targets in certain number of years. If she does, then she could vest in greater and greater and greater amounts of this, this executive benefit through my non-qualified deferred comp plan. Um, so it has, has a lot of power. Once you remove um, the employee vest in their amounts and you remove what we call a substantial right of forfeiture, in other words, the employee if he or she wanted to can access the funds, at that point they're taxable. So what are the two types? Salary deferral. And this is real easy. This is where an executive agrees to defer his or her salary. So they're deferring receipt of compensation in the here and now. That's not currently taxable, obviously. That's why you're deferring it. And as long as you have a substantial right of forfeiture, something that could happen where potentially that benefit could go away. 
Um, SERP arrangements, they're supplemental, supplemental executive retirement plans. These are things above and beyond what the employee would defer themselves. These are special arrangements from employers. And that's where kind of the vesting schedules come in. Because with salary deferral, you're always vested in your own benefits, right? There's some tax advantages, but you're always vested in it. The SERP arrangements, since this isn't your money to begin with, you're not necessarily vested in it. And then you could attach a vesting schedule to it. So SERPs allow um, probably you know, the top of the pyramid, if you will, control over, over an executive. All right, we're moving quick here. So what are the advantages? Um, you could permissibly discriminate. You could do informal financing options. We talked about those. Um, these are, if you're gonna use life insurance, these are gonna be COLE arrangements. So corporate owned life insurance. These could provide a good balance sheet sale opportunities. Often businesses that are attracted to deferred comp will look at the balance sheet and like the idea of having an asset on their balance sheet. That's what permanent cash value life insurance does for you. So that is an awesome benefit and for the right type of employer, that's good. Wanna be clear here, um, cause I just got a text from somebody cause they think I'm gonna forget it and I won't. Um, this is an arrangement where it's a deferred <laughs> tax deduction. So unlike executive bonus, um, Chris, unlike an executive bonus arrangement, what this is is it's deferred tax de deduction. When the employee, the executive actually gets the benefit, that's when it's deducted for uh, compensation purposes for the employer. So the employer, the business owner has to have the mindset where they're okay, even though it's a balance sheet sell, even though you're you know, providing in many cases a vesting schedule, they're not gonna get the upfront tax deduction until later on down the road when the employee vests and there's no longer a substantial right of forfeiture. Um, that's a tax deduction at that point, taxable to the executive. You don't get away from from that in any way, shape or form. But I just wanted to make that clear. And also, and I love my legal department at my company because they make me make a little disclaimer here. I think it's an important one. If this is gonna be an employer owned life insurance contract, um, it comes under the EOLI rules, uh, employer owned life insurance. And all that is, and we're not throwing too many internal revenue code provisions at you today, just a few, all that is, it comes under what we call 101J. So if you have an employer-owned life insurance contract on an employee, um, you have to authenticate that notice has been given to that employee, they, that they've consented to life insurance uh, being taken out on their life. And you have to document that. So um, almost every carrier I'm aware of these days make sure that they, they've abide by that requirement doesn't change just because it's deferred compensation is the primary point I'm trying to make with that. Okay, benefits for the employee. Targets and rewards, key executives. It's flexible. There's a lot you could do with it from a, from a flexibility perspective. People are still trying to get in, awesome. Deferral tax until later when more favorable tax bracket. Yeah, that's an important point. Although it doesn't always happen, I'm not a big believer in this part of it but sometimes you are in a lower tax bracket uh, when you retire. So high tax bracket now, lower one later, maybe it's better to defer um, the receipt of that income until later on when you retire and presumably be paying less taxes per se. All right, so points to ponder. Uh, this is deferral of the employer's tax deductions. The benefits which are owed to the employee do become a liability on the books. From the employee perspective, um, excuse me, before I get into that, um, there's cost administration. It's gonna be higher, frankly, than it will be for a, you know, a traditional bonus plan where you might not even have to have written documentation. Um, a little bit higher than even a split dollar plan. Okay, from the execu executive's perspective, keep in mind that you will be taxed on this at some point in time, and this is deferred comp. And so what that means is that this is unsecured. If your uh, business goes under between 
you know, now <laughs> and the time that you're supposed to invest in these benefits, you might not get your money. And so um, it's a contingent promise. In order for this to be outside of the umbrella, the rules and restrictions of qualified plans, um, these monies have to be subject to a substantial right of forfeiture and they have to be unsecured. Um, that's just how, how the rules work. I added this kind of at the last moment. This is an opportunity to go ahead and compare and contrast based upon all the criteria that we looked at, split dollar, executive bonus, and um, deferred compensation. So this is the year, we have the bonus concept coming up really quick here, but this is the year, in my opinion, to really talk about these three concepts with your business owners as far as it, as far as it relates to executive benefits and, and their key employees. This should, should help you. So you might wanna keep this on your desk because you could, it could kind of summarize everything I've spoken about in 40 minutes into less than 30 seconds. Okay. The bonus concept, all right, this is the short-term deferral twist. So this is combining kind of in my mind, the, the best of everything we've talked about into a, a completely new paradigm. It's not for everyone. So I'm not pretending that it is, but if you have an executive, a business owner that will fit certain criteria, this will give you a new narrative, a new something to talk about. So. What is the short-term deferral twist? So all this is, is endorsement split dollar on steroids. That's pretty much what it is. And another way to visualize it, um, just kind of picture goalpost at a football game. You have executive, ex executive bonus over here, and then maybe non-qualified deferred comp over here. Is there a plan that gives you the ease and simplicity of executive bonus but without some of the worry and cost and complication of, of some deferred comp plans? The short-term deferral twist arrangement can kind of be like kicking that ball kind of right down the middle of that, of that goal post. So how does that work? So you have two agreements, you have a bonus agreement. So I'm bonusing a key employee, a key executive, a certain lump sum after a period of time. I wanna keep Suzanne around the business, Ren Inc for the next 20 years. I'm gonna promise her a certain bonus. So this is gonna be above and beyond what I'm give, giving her by way of qualified plans. Now, let's say it's a million dollars because she's fantastic. So it's a million dollars. That's the first agreement, more detail just a little bit. A uh, split dollar, this is also a split dollar agreement. That's why I mean about being endorsement split dollar and steroids. This is an arrangement where it's gonna be uh, an endorsement split dollar arrangement where the employer is gonna be the nominal owner. So how, I'm, and this is where the agreements kind of fit, fit in with one another. I'm gonna go ahead and be able to honor that bonus agreement because of my split dollar agreement. So yes. There's a little layer of complication because you have two agreements and not just one, but I think you'll see that this is gonna provide you significant flexibility, which you would never have imagined. So think about it this way. So we've done an endorsement split dollar arrangement. Suzanne, she's the, she's the insured, she's the, the key executive. I'm promising her a million dollars in 20 years per se. I'm sure she's listening and she knows me a little bit. She'd probably insist on 2 million, but Suzanne is just going to be 1 million. That's going to be what our agreement's going to be. We have an endorsement arrangement, two outcomes here. So let's say Suzanne doesn't make it to the end of the rainbow. She doesn't make it to the end of the 20 years. We have an endorsement arrangement. Remember, we just talked about that. I'm the employer. I'm going to get my the higher the cash value or my premiums back. I'm happy, at least from an economic standpoint, I did lose Suzanne. She's gonna have, or at least her <laughs> beneficiaries are gonna have the rest of those death proceeds tax-free because she was paying that low cost rent using table 2001. That's just endorsement split dollar. This is where the short-term deferral twist is different, if you will. This is where you might wanna soup it up a little bit. Um, the short-term deferral twist uses an exception within 409A. Remember I talked about 409A and how that codifies deferred comp? 
Well, there's an exception within 409A, so follow me here. As long as you bonus an employee and executive an, an amount within two and a half months of the period of time that they vest in that amount after the end of the taxable year, it's exempt from 409A. Let me translate that to real English for a moment. Let's say we get to the end of our 20 years and the end of the 20 years ends on December 31st, all right? As long as by March 15th of the 21st year, I bonus Suzanne that million dollars, which could be met by the cash values of the life insurance contract or from another source, it's exempt from 409A. In 409A, and you heard me correctly, there's something called the short-term deferral exception. So you can make a promise of a, loot, a future lump sum to somebody all day long. And yeah, under the traditional rules of 409A, that would come under you know, all the rules and restrictions. But as long as you do it in a lump sum and quickly within two and a half months with investing in the amount, it doesn't have to be 20 years, it could be 10 years. It's exempt from all the rules, restrictions, and other onerous requirements that you might have with a traditional um, 409A covered plan. So in my mind, this gives you a lot of the ease and simplicity. Yes, you have two agreements of executive bonus, but you avoid the cost and complexity of a deferred compensation arrangement. Deferred comp is awesome. Executive bonus is awesome. But if you want to combine those two into an arrangement where the employer still has control, but a little less costly, and they're okay with kind of doing the lump sum arrangement, it's a great deal. Just like traditional deferred comp, it is tax deductible, fully tax deductible, that bonus, as long as it's considered to be within reasonable compensation guidelines, taxable to Suzanne at the, at the end of the day. And you could do all kinds of different twists and turns with, with the short-term deferral twist if, if you want. So it's a great flexible tool on top of some of the other awesome tools we already talked about here today, whether it's split dollar executive bonus or the di different iterations of deferred comp. So I am gonna go ahead, because I am right at just past 45 minutes. And I believe that there might be an opportunity for us to ask some, some questions or do some more inquiry. So I'll open it up at this point. Yeah, we do have a couple questions. And so again, the information, Andrew, is always is amazing. This is why I know we've had a couple of people kind of comment like, whoa. And again, that's why you can partner together, right? That's why you don't have to yourself be yeah. a, an expert. We have experts out there within our NAFA network. So one question that we've definitely gotten is, you know, you're discussing non-qualified benefits for the top hat employees, but what are the signals or how can advisors know who qualifies or falls into that group? Like what's the indicator when they should say, okay, this is a this is when I should start to talk about this, uh, you know, bring up this conversation. That's a great, great question. Um, yeah, just like many things in life, there's, uh, this is more uh, of an art rather than a, a science. So <laughs> uh, typically what you looked at, and I'll give you some quantifiable measures. So to look at that top hat, you know, what the IRS is looking for is they want to make sure that this is not a, a disguised qualified plan, that you're truly trying to benefit, you know, your top executives. So, and I've read, you know, court rulings, revenue rulings, a few PLRs. Typically, they're looking at, you know, right around the top 10, arguably 15% most highly paid employees. So, you're, you know, you're looking to split off the top. So, get a sense as that helps. If you want to make it numerical, another ruling I read one time is you want to look at individuals that are highly comped and make more than the social security wage base. And I forget what that is for 2021, but I believe it's right around $136,000 or $137,000. So that's another way if they make above that social security wage base, they're going to be in that select group, that top hat. You're going to be able to offer these benefits, executive bonus, deferred comp, and that twist plan that I talked about at the end of the day. So, and, you know, contact your advanced markets representative and they can give you the longer version of this and kind of keep you in safe territory. So what about this? Uh, a question just came in. Can the president of an S Corp be included as a beneficiary? Um, yes, it's easy to answer that yes, but I'm not 
sure what kind of plan that they're talking about, but uh, you're not going to get tax leverage, you know, with a, a president of an S corp because it's, it's considered to be a pass through uh, with a, an executive bonus arrangement or a, a collateral assignment split dollar plan. But there's nothing to prevent an officer, in this case, a president from being, you know, a, 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 a beneficiary of a plan. And, you know, it's hard because you don't know the full facts behind the question. You got to be careful whether or not this could be a taxable trifecta, depending how ownership is split up, insured versus, versus beneficiary. But on, on just on the face of it, Suzanne, just with the question, there'd be, you know, no, no prohibition against that. Is there a best arrangement for having a pass through? Yeah, so um, not necessarily kind of, you know, this is where we can kind of keep it simple. You know, a pass through is a pass through. So uh, those are the best entities as far as being able to benefit those key executives, those key employees that are not owners. And, you know, the, there's, there's no tax arbitrage between uh, the pass through and the owners themselves. With the C Corp, there is. So there's things we can do. Um, it's very common to have, you know, loan regime split dollar arrangements used for owners of C-Corps because of that tax arbitrage. It's not unusual to see executive bonus arrangements like, like that as well. So that's where I would draw the line between those, those two different arrangements. Okay, great. And then um, finally, the question I see is that um, if, the, if the employer does want to main control, are there good alternatives to the traditional deferred comp plan and executive bonus arrangements? And I know you touched on this, but maybe you could just reiterate. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it kind of brings you right back into kind of that middle ground between the two. If you, you know, don't do the traditional deferred comp, you don't do the executive bonus, you want something right in the middle. In my mind, that short-term deferral twist is that thing right in the middle because it gives you that control because you are the owner as the business owner. You own that life insurance contract. You're the, you're the legal owner of it. But at the end of the day, um, if you meet the exception, that short-term deferral exception, you don't have to worry about the rules and restrictions of 409A, um, the penalties that you could possibly run into. Again, deferred comp is awesome, but again, if you want that business owner that's looking for something effective and efficient, that's further up the pyramid than tr traditional executive bonus, if they don't want to do the top of the pyramid, which is deferred comp, I'd invite them to look at the short-term deferral twist for that. And then um, to all of our attendees, yes. Um, Andrew, are you willing to share your, your slides with us so we can get your, your great charts and whatnot that you've had? Is Absolutely. Okay, Absolutely, wonderful, Suzanne. thank you. Yes. So I think we will wrap it up. Um, stay tuned, so we're gonna meet back. Thank you again, Andrew, and thank you for Emeritus for all of the support. Uh, wonderful partner. And again, we always benefit from our collaboration with FSP. Um, okay. We're gonna stop right now. Everybody take a brief pause. We'll meet back at three o'clock Eastern for our final session. We're gonna continue the talk on split, split dollar. And we're gonna talk about this in conjunction with not-for-profit organizations or tax exempt organizations. Join with us um, uh, with Eric Stearns from Stearns Financial. So with that, thank you everybody. We will see you in uh, about uh, 12 or so minutes. Okay, talk to you soon. <laughs>